everyone, I am Will, or Hexparrot, creator of MinOS. Today's video is about using the new Node.js based web user interface. This comes now with the MinOS turnkey ISO, or can be installed atop an existing or new Linux or BSD server. I already have a server already set up for this, so I can, we can go ahead and connect to it. Uh, you connect with HTTPS, the IP address, and 8443 is the port number. Now sign in with a non-root username. In this case, I've created the username Will with my password. And the web user interface is going to look much like it did on the previous uh, Python-based interface, but with one key difference, and that's in profiles. So let's go ahead and take a look at profiles and see what's different about this new one. When you click on profiles, you're going to see a list of available server jars and packs. Uh, right here, you'll see um, all the different server jars available from Mojang, but also if you pull down this drop down, you'll see Feed the Beast, Pocket Mine, Bungie Cord. Those are all readily available for you to download uh, and create a new server with. Keep in mind this does not limit which server jars or um, packs you're allowed to use, but merely just the ones that will be downloaded automatically. And I'll go into that more in the future or in, later in this video. So I'm going to go ahead and create a 1.88 video. I'm going to hit download and we'll start seeing a download indicator here and that it succeeded. I'm going to create a new server. All right, and this is the only field that is required to be filled out. The rest of these you can fill out at any time, even after you create the server, and you can modify them at any time as well. And this is a normal conventional server, so we're gonna leave this checks box blank. Now, an unconventional server is something I've dubbed for any server that doesn't use the server properties. Uh, text file. So uh, Bungie Cord doesn't use it, Pocket Mine, CubeWrite, any of those servers, you can go ahead and hit the unconventional server, which will hide some features that just were specific to server properties. So let me go ahead and create the new server. And you can see it shows up here on the dashboard. Now the only thing you need to do to get this server up and running is choosing a runnable job. Now what shows up in the runnable jar dropdown is actually any jar file or far file that is in this directory, bar games Minecraft server's first server. Now because it's a new server, that is empty, and hence this dropdown is empty. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask MinOS to make available one of those jars by choosing this profile, 1.8.8. Now we can see Minecraft server is selected. So if you were to import a server, or if you were to just drop the jar file down there yourself because it wasn't a pre-configured profile, you do not need to use profiles at all. You can just go straight to this, choose the jar file that's already in that directory, and then you can go from there. Now I'm going to change the amount of RAM to 512 for XMX. That's the maximum heap size. You can change the XMS if you choose, or any additional Java arguments if you desire. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just start this server. Um, once you start the server, you're going to start seeing things illuminate here, memory footprints, and also, as you can see down here, the logging logs, latest.log. Once it detects that that file exists, it shows up on the left-hand side of the panel. Now, ever since roughly 1.7.10, the end-user license agreement was required for Minecraft servers. So anytime MinOS detects that the EULA does not equal true, in this case, false as default, this pop-up will show up. So you can go ahead and accept the Yuli here after you read it, and then you can restart that server. The server is down right now. We bring it right back up, and we can see actually in the log, it's gonna live update. Now what we see here at the top and bottom of this page is a text box which will allow you to send commands directly to the console as if you're at the command line itself. So I can opt myself. I can look for other things such as help, say, teleport, all the commands that are available. Um, you can send through here. This will go straight to the Minecraft instance in the background. So I can go ahead and show you a couple of these other features. Uh, we have a copy profile to live server files. Um, what that does is every single time you hit start, it checks to see if the profile is available in that directory. And if it's not, then it copies those files for you. Now you might feel the desire to copy those 
server files manually if, for example, you don't want to start the server, but you want the server to have those files already. So if you are just creating templates, or if you want to have uh, 1.88 vanilla there, but then instead you choose to a spigot installation, that might depend on that jar file. Uh, here we have the broadcast to LAN checkbox. If we go into Java, we'll, by default, Vanilla Minecraft does not broadcast on UDP that that server exists. So if I click the broadcast to LAN, we'll actually see it appear now. And this is a minor less function. Um, some other server softwares might already be broadcasting, in which case you can ignore that and keep that off. All right, start server on boot. Naturally, if you have to restart the host system, then this will automatically start up the servers. And then here's the, this is not a conventional Minecraft server, which again you would use for any server that doesn't use server properties. So if you were to click it, it hides server properties and other things that are relevant to that sort of server. And at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, at the same time, it just makes things a little cleaner for you. Um, if you have a bungee cord or whatever server that you know you're never going to need those. Alright, so restore points are incremental backups. Whenever you need to make an incremental backup, that's something that you can do on a regular basis because each incremental is very low cost in hard drive space, which allows you to have several restore points to go back to. So I'll create a restore point right now. I can create it on this page or I can create it on the server status page. And you can see here, 0B, that means it's a mirror. That means at this point, Minecraft takes up 11 megabytes of size in space. If I were to stop the server, let me stop the server through the console, all those chunks get committed to disk. And if I create a brand new restore point, you can see it has a change of 248 kilobytes. Now remember, the key behind restore points is that now I can restore and be exactly to where I'm at here, or I can be exactly where I'm at here. Now if you keep a running schedule of backups, you can keep them on hourly or every two hours or whatever it is you choose. That way you can actually go back in time or go, go forward in time as often as you please, and you'll never lose it. Doing a restore does not, uh, it overwrites what gets run, but it doesn't delete that restore. So you can go back five days and then go back to your current day. That's completely a valid thing to do. Um, let's see, available archives. Archives are full uh, single file, um, like they're like zip files, compressed archives, but in this case, since it's Linux, it's going to be creating a .tar.gz file. As you can see, it's a timestamp file. And then with that, you can either delete archives if you need to get rid of them because they start accumulating over time or you can create a server from them. All right, and as you can see here, all your archives go into this directory, all your restore points go into that directory. And you have a little bit of an update of when these things actually were created. So if I create my restore point, you can see it shows up there. Um, here in Java settings, uh, you have the Heap size, the minimum heap size, and additional Java arguments. Ownership and dish usage covers who owns the server and who can connect to it if you're not that user. So will obviously can connect to it and user group will, but if I were joined to any other groups, um, maybe a users group, an admin group, an MC group, anything like that, any group that I'm subscribed to, I can actually change the group owner to, allowing other users coming into the web UI to log in with their name, Bob, and as long as they're part of the same sharing user for this server, they will be able to see this page and interact with all these functions. Um, if you also want to delete the server, you can do that from the web UI by checking all these boxes. The red box illuminates when all three checkboxes are selected and the server is down. Uh, other things that you can do while the server is up that might not be immediately clear is you can stop the server, stop the server and then immediately make a backup, restart it, or kill the server. Uh, killing the server often is a non-graceful close, so you only want to do that if there's a crash or the process stalls, anything like that where you're sure 
that there's nothing that you're going to lose or whatever you're going to lose is acceptable. And if you ever need to accept a EULA because you don't want it to just pop up, you can just click on that box and get to this manually. Other than that, uh, you can import a server. When you import a server, you want to put it inside bar games minecraft import and then it will automatically populate in this area here and it will allow you to create a new server actually it looks identical to this which is create server from archive and that should be all it really takes to get your first server up and running um, I'm going to create additional videos talking about unconventional servers such as pocket mine or bungee cord or even scheduling but uh, that will all be taken care of in a later video, so I hope this helped out. And as always, if you need any help, find me on the support forums or send me an email. Thanks and bye.